We're going to go ahead and get started with the final panel of the symposium. Uh, we're going out with a bang, uh, talking about always timely issues about executive power. Uh, so welcome to the final panel. Um, it's entitled Modern Debates, Old Insights, The Federalists, Anti-Federalists, and Executive Power. I have the great pleasure of introducing the moderator for this panel, Judge Paul Mady. Judge Mady serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Before his appointment to the bench in 2019, he was a partner in the New Jersey office of Lowenstein Sandler. Earlier, Judge Mady was a senior vice president, general counsel, and secretary for University Hospital Newark, an academic medical center and teaching hospital. He also served as the deputy chief counsel to Governor Chris Christie and as an AUSA for the District of New Jersey, where he was awarded the Justice Department's Director's Award for superior performance. Judge Mady also spent a few years at Kellogg Hansen in Washington, D.C., and himself clerked for judges on the District of New Jersey and the Third Circuit. He's a graduate of the University of Scranton and Seton Hall University School of Law. Judge Mady, we're honored to have you here, along with the rest of our distinguished panelists. I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Is this on? It doesn't sound like it. I don't think the mic's on. On the mic's on? It doesn't sound like it. There we go. Is that better? No. This is going to force me to yell in that judicial voice. <laughs> I like it. I have been directed to keep going, so keep going. I shall. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to join so many old friends and so many future leaders at this important conference. Even if we are here to talk about a topic that is not new and is not complicated. I mean, that's at least what I was led to believe by the star of stage and song, Alexander Hamilton. After all, didn't he write that there is hardly any part of the proposal of Article 2 of which could have been attended to with greater difficulty, and certainly none which has been inveighed against with less candor or criticized with less judgment. This was to be no monarch in waiting. No, he thundered. It would be difficult to determine whether the president would possess more or less power than the governor of New York. And who could possibly think a dictator would ever arise in Albany? <laughs> and come to mention it, doesn't history teach us that a little classical dictatorship is essential to good government? Didn't Hamilton also tell us that the least conversant in Roman story knows how often the Republic took refuge in the absolute power of a single man? And not just against foreign enemies, but to combat those pesky, domestic, ambitious individuals who were aspiring to tyranny. A feeble executive, after all, implies a feeble execution of government. So by all means, wrote John Adams, separate the powers, but largely because, quote, people's rights and liberties can never be preserved without a strong executive. And that executive power, of course, has to be kept away from the people and their legislature. And since those views won the day, or at least the days of ratification, well, what are we here to debate? Is our current discontent about executive power pinned to the executives we've come to know? Why, in other words, did Arthur Schlesinger Jr. worry in 1973, but not 1963, that the constitutional presidency has become an imperial presidency? And is our mostly recent fretting about non-delegation, that executive limiting doctrine last seen in a 1936 curtain call, really a true return to Lockean laws of nature, or just a natural attempt to lock away legal powers from presidents on the other side of, well, whatever issue is at issue? Are we, in short, simply replaying the old home movies of Pompey and Cicero longing for the republic that might have been if only the forefathers of federalism had not been so swayed against truly separated powers by their ancient tutors. Or have we awoken to remember the genius of the agreement that we accepted in 1788? 
an agreement that, as Paine would write, rallying to revolution would keep liberty safe from those always tempted to cross the river that protects the republic. Because so far as we approve in, of monarchy in America, the law is king and there ought to be no other. It is, as Justice Gorsuch wrote, quoting Professor Gary Lawson, that if Congress can pass off the legislative power to the executive branch, well then the entire structure of the Constitution would make no sense. Hmm. Turns out there is much still to debate, and we are exceptionally fortunate today to have this panel to explore these questions. Like you, I am delighted to have the chance to learn from these thinkers, beginning with our first panelist, Professor Jennifer Mascott. Professor Mascott is an assistant professor of law and co-executive director of the C. E. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at the Antonin Scalia Law School. She serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States and from 2019 to 2021 as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Libra Counsel. Her scholarship has appeared in journals across the country and in the opinions of the Supreme Court. She is a former law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas and then Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Professor, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a, an honor to be here and appreciate you all sticking with us throughout this whole uh, conference here to have the final substantive panel before we have our great um, dinner and set of receptions this evening. And I just I feel very honored to be um, up here and have the chance to talk with everybody. And so since I'm leading things off, I figured that I would start by maybe putting the discussion today in, in, a, in some context. Why are we talking about the executive power? What are the stakes? Why should it be important to us to examine it? So the topic of our panels, the Federalist, Anti-Federalist, and the Executive Power. And so we're trying to unearth what the debates were obviously back in the 1780s and around that time. But um, why is this such an important issue? And I think, you know, just from our lived experience, we can see, um, and speaking as a former executive branch lawyer, as was mentioned, and Professor Rappaport up here also served um, in the Office of Legal Counsel, which for those of you not familiar, it is really the um, sort of the lawyer's lawyer, the executive power sort of extraordinaire office in the um, executive branch because the Office of Legal Counsel has been delegated the Attorney General's authority to interpret the law for the President, um, which was authority that the Attorney General first received in 1789 um, by statute. And so the office has basically sort of a body of common law that's built up over, over the decades where it's charged with answering constitutional questions for the executive branch and for the president. And so if the president is wondering, do I have the constitutional power to initiate this military attack? Do I have the constitutional power to, um, you know, pardon a particular person or whatever the question might be, some real, some maybe didn't, some hypothetical um, in the examples I'm mentioning, that kind of question would go to the Office of Legal Counsel. And so you can see um, when you're in the government and experiencing it, how appro it, appropriately in a certain sense, um, you know, people who are charged with directing to the president are gonna answer these questions with the president and the executive <laughs> branch interest at heart. And over the decades and the centuries, of course, the executive branch has grown quite powerful. And actually, not just in the Office of Legal Counsel, but across the entire executive branch, just are reams and reams, scores and scores, hundreds and hundreds of attorneys whose job is to figure out, you know, lawfully what can the executive do with statutory authority, constitutional authority. And so, as a practical matter, because I think the president commands now so many agencies, right, and he constitutionally was charged in a lot of ways with foreign affairs and national security power, which my colleagues here will talk about how much appropriately was he charged with and how much not. Not, the office commands now quite a vast share of um, federal power. And so it's really important, I think, for us to think about is that the way that it was originally designed to be? Does the executive have too much of the share of the power now? If so, is that true as a domestic matter? Is it true as a matter of international affairs? Um, what can be done about it? And it's interesting to think through what the constitutional mechanisms might be for accountability there. Obviously, if you're a Madisonian and you've read through your constitution and some of the Federalist Papers, which I would imagine many of us here at the Federalist Society have done, you'll see that one of the original ideas was that um, each 
each branch was going to, at the federal level, separation of powers, keep the other one in line because each branch would presumably have institutional interests. And so what would keep the executive perhaps from getting too much of a share of the power? It would be Congress. It would maybe be the judiciary rising up and protecting its own institutional interests. And so it would be interesting to think now in the 21st century, is that model operating in the same way? Does the rise of two political parties change the alignment and the institution? So are se separation of powers between the branches working in as pure of a way as maybe some would have initially thought? Or now are folks' interests more aligned with their political parties such that it's not actually a fight between the president and Congress, but it's the president and the members of Congress of his or her political party versus the others. And does that um, impact the institutional interest? And should we be concerned about it? And what do we do about it as a constitutional matter? Um, I mean, obviously, one thing we can do if we have questions about um, separation of powers of the executive is try to think through whether then Congress as a co-equal branch is playing its proper role. There's been a lot of discussion this weekend already, you know, being skeptical that that's uh, the case. And personally, as a former executive branch lawyer, now an ad law um, constitutional scholar, I also um, am concerned about it and study it. So we have a separation of powers in the political branch seminar, actually, that we just started at Scalia Law School this past year with one of my um, old um, executive branch colleagues where we actually look at the congressional power, the executive power, building on a lot of the scholarship of the folks up here on the stage and others who spoke this weekend, Professor Amar, Professor McConnell, and figure out what tools does each branch have and in my capacity at the Gray Center, we have actually just in the last few weeks opened a congressional education division where I now, in addition to teaching classes at the law school, have been going over to Congress to actually try to teach staff about separation of powers and the Constitution. And it's not really complicated. It's just the staff there aren't really lawyers. And so we just go you know, provision by provision through the Constitution, like what can Congress actually be doing because it's not, you know, it's not always clear that there are the same um, institutional tools there to be able to examine and think about those issues in the way that the executive branch empowered with hundreds of attorneys and its own constitutional law shop in OLC is able to do. Um, in my uh, academic capacity to try to get at the founding era debate, um, I'd be curious what um, folks up here have to say in response, but um, my, my scholarship has been somewhat focused on the appointments clause, looking at the electoral constraints or appointments constraints on, on the executive branch. And that uh, study suggests that at least at the founding, one source of accountability was going to be accountability in selecting the president selecting people who were, who were gonna be serving in the federal government. And the appointments clause gives the primary appointments authority, of course, to the president with Senate consent. And then there are alternative mechanisms for inferior officers. And my early research suggested that those constraints should really apply um, to most of the people exercising federal power in the executive branch. But the question, I guess, is were those constraints a principal constraint on accountability in the executive branch? Where does the appointments clause fit within the executive power um, writ large? Was the appointments clause actually a reduction in the president's power, an expansion of it? If you see the president's executive power as, as being in the vesting clause of Article II, which I think is um, really actually a core um, issue of debate or perhaps some, um, some difference to varying degrees between uh, scholars up here, maybe the appointments clause actually takes away power Power from the president and gives it to Congress in establishing laws where maybe the executive power originally meant to supervise and staff the executive branch. And if it did, then the appointments clause actually reduces the president's authority quite a bit. And so if you're somebody who's concerned about presidential authority, you would actually want a very expansive uh, meaning of the officers of the United States because that gives Congress through its office creation role um, and the Senate through its advice and consent function arguably a greater role in staffing the executive branch and keeping accountability in the separation of powers than it would have um, otherwise. So um, I'm trying to pack this a little bit more um, academically. Uh, my most recent project, which I started first in 2018 before going into the government, and so I'm just now getting back to it, is to try to unpack this a little bit more by going through the ratification debates to see what the larger theories and discussion were about uh, accountability. And um, for those of you who have studied and thought about originalist interpretation, um, looking at the ratification debates, there might be a lot of folks even up here on the, on the stage who would say, well, gosh, that's not really great, pure originalist methodology because it's just one source 
course, and you don't want to take statements from the ratification debates. And I, I agree with all of that. I think the ratification debates are, so, my, so this current piece is really just sort of one more bit to try to get it theoretically. What did folks at that time think? was going to keep this big, vast, pot potentially vast or new um, machine of government accountable and how, were, how was it going to be responsive to the people and just sort of one more information source. The only reason we might care about the ratification debates is because um, obviously um, it was the state ratification conventions, right, whose votes in um, approving and ratifying the Constitution actually gave it its power, and so to the extent that you think that the mindset of the people who voted to um, make the Constitution our governing law was relevant, you would look at it. If you were an original public meaning person, obviously you think it's one of multiple sources that you should look at. Um, and then you, know, you just have to take all of these debates and discussions, I think, in context and look at many, many different sources. And that's one reason actually why I admire and, and think so much of the work of everybody up here is because I think methodologically all of the scholars really that we've had a chance to listen to this weekend have done extensive work in original sources reading perspectives of many different of many different people so before I we move on what were at least from the ratification debates and the initial part portions of them that I've looked at mostly the um, mostly the Virginia debates what were some of the things that they said about executive power what did they say about um, accountability in general and clearly you know so a lot of the same structural themes that we're talking about all weekend were front and center so the first First was electoral accountability. Um, so that raises, I guess, some questions for us when we're thinking about executive power, because of course when the Constitution was first ratified, the president could serve for an indefinite number of terms. So if electoral accountability is key to keeping power in check, what do we do now with the 22nd Amendment where the president can only serve for two terms? And as a matter of custom, George Washington only served for two terms. So does that mean that the president and the whole executive structure is not going to have proper accountability incentives when it's no longer seeking re-election? I guess, um, practically speaking, maybe the president could be concerned about his legacy, but does that somehow impact things? Well. I think one answer there is that uh, when the founders were thinking about executive power and the share of the power and they were thinking about electoral constraints, you'll see actually repeatedly in the ratification debate statements made about how the House of Representatives was going to have such a vast share of policymaking power. It's reflected in constitutional provisions such as revenue bills having to originate in the House. And the idea was that the executive would hold a comparatively little share of the piece of the pie. Now, my personal understanding from, and, and from reading scholarship and reading the debates is that when the president has that power, he or she needs to be in full command of it. So if you're thinking about the executive power vertically and supervision, it's sort of complete and total. There shouldn't be anything out of the executive branch that's veering away from it, right? The vesting of all executive powers in the president. But when you're looking at the whole federal government, how much of the share of the power does he or she have? Well, at least in the policymaking stage, some of the ratification debate statements suggest really not all that all that much. Oh, and the other important piece that I that I should have mentioned um, is it is hard to talk about things like executive power in a vacuum. We're doing it up here, but it's really important to think about it, I think, in the context of the other structural constraint, federalism, which we heard a lot about earlier today, right? Because it's very hard to understand what's happening at the federal level and what the executive's going to do if you don't understand and keep in mind that there were going to be many, many other separate governments still doing the principal share of the policy making um, at the state at the state level. And it's like another reason why if Professor Mortensen and I were actually at a conference together in the fall where we were supposed to be critiquing a book on comparative law, comparing US law to other national, uh, inter, uh, other nations laws. And there was a lot of comparison suggest it, the critiques being made of separation of powers or what the various branches were doing. But what was interesting is that the other systems of government to which the US was being compared did not have the same federalist system of divided, you know, uh, vertical, vertical power. And so how much does that change things? Probably quite a bit because again, maybe separation of powers was going to be understood to work in a system that really was a government of enumerated powers and was not doing nearly as much at the top level um, because of the states. And so uh, what does that mean for us in, in the 21st century? So, so electoral accountability is going to be key. The other thing, uh, the structural accountability, the division of power between the branches. I'll pull out one int int interesting quote um, of, of an early sort of description 
um, in one of the debates about um, what the, exec the Edmund Pendleton, the presiding officer of the Virginia Ratifying Convention, explained it as following. The legislature was going to fix rules, impose sanctions, and point out the punishment of the transgressors of these rules. An executive was going to watch over the officers, bring them to punishment. So that's it. The executive watch over the officers bring them to punishment on domestic stage. A judiciary to guard the innocent and fix the guilty by a fair trial. So again, at least at the time, the legislature was going to really be doing the policy making. The executive was going to carry it out. And there were going to be a lot of judicial protections. And to build on um, one a reference Professor Amar made earlier today, uh, you can also see a lot of reference to juries in the ratification debates. And it's curious to think today is one reason why we maybe don't immediately recognize administrative power as a deviation from um, the constitutional norms is maybe because we aren't as, as highly valuing juries, which of course are not present at all in uh, administrative adjudication. Okay, so there's gonna be structural accountability, separation at the federal level. So these themes are talked about a lot, which is one reason why I think officer accountability is hard to measure what the founding era understanding of it was specifically because it's a matter of reading like debates and theories. It's not as though there's one word or one concept in the Constitution that's going to inform us. Um, the, the ratifiers thought that the federal officers were going to be subject to the laws that they enacted, that that was going to be a key constraint. And so that's curious to think about today, right? Because at least with Congress, there are many laws that Congress passes that it's not subject to itself, like Freedom of Information Act laws. Um, Madison at least thought state officers might be used to perform federal functions. Now we have the anti-commandeering doctrine. So how do those work, work together? And then... Um, Obviously, the incompatibility clause protections, members of Congress were not supposed to be creating offices that they were going to go fill and serve. An interesting deviation from this, um, one of my family members used to work on the Hill years ago, and um, his boss was trying for years and years and years to get a um, human rights or international religious freedom commission established. Couldn't get it done, couldn't get the law passed. Finally, at the at very last conference stages of a huge omnibus bill, got a call from a leadership staffer that said, I was finally able to get your boss's commission created and stuck in at the very last minute to this hundreds of pages long bill. And my family member a few months later noticed that this leadership staffer then left the leadership office and ended up serving in a very important role on that commission. So the incompatibility clause did not apply to the staffer, but as a reality, they are the ones getting the bills drafted. So maybe it's not sufficiently broad, the protections. <laughs> um, and then the final thing, individual accountability. There was, you know, we always think about impeachment. We think about removal of officers. There was a lot of discussion about common law causes of action. Tort action was the mechanism that they was at least used initially, state law tort action with federal officers. Um, but, you know, there's discussion about, well, we can't just rely on impeachment because who's going to be able to get all the way to D.C. to be able to bring impeachment uh, um, charges and, and to use that mechanism so we need common law um, causes of action potentially. Um, also, what was interesting in reading through the first Congress sta uh, congressional statutes, uh, officers often had to post bond. Anybody who was going to be collecting money, like a customs officer, a revenue officer, was going to have to have some of huge, like tens of thousands of dollars of bond that was going to be a surety that they um, did not engage in bad actions. Um, and then uh, there were also some interesting conflict of interest provisions all put in congressional statutes. These are not just regulations and things made by other people. It's statutes, folks accountable back to the people. But um, so hopefully in the not too distant future, um, there will be a chance to plumb this a lot more. But I think there's a very, very rich sense in the founding era debates about the need for accountability in the exercise of power. There was a re very real sense that it was going to be Congress doing things and not just this one person seated in the executive um, branch heading, heading all of that power. And um, you know, hopefully we can. And, and, and the final point: it's just very interesting. It's very important, I think, to think about. Um, and regardless of what sides you fall down on, at the end of the day, be thinking about, be revisiting um, the old debates and asking um, where are the people who are in charge and exercising power claiming? What are they claiming as the source of that? As a source of that power, and is it being used, um, you know, responsibly in the best interest of the electorate? Thank you, Professor. Next, we are joined by Professor Julian Mortensen, the James G. Phil Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. His scholarship includes articles, books, and case books on the powers of the federal government at the founding. 
and his academic work complements an active litigation practice in the federal and state courts. Before arriving in Michigan, Professor Mortensen worked in the President's Office of the International Criminal Tribunal, the former Yugoslavia, and he served as a law clerk for both Justice David Souter and Judge Harvey Wilkinson. Professor, welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you for the, uh, the kind introduction. It's, it's terrific to be here. Um, really enjoyed um, hearing Professor Mascott's uh, presentation and looking forward to the rest as well. Um, I've tried to pitch my comments um, toward the, I guess the, you know, they say it in law school, be sure you answer the call of the exam question. Um, I, I thought that the structure of anti-federalist versus federalist is an interesting take um, on a way to sort of structure thoughts and arguments. And so what I'm trying to do, what I'm gonna try to do is to offer, first of all, a structure of kind of the common conceptual grammar of executive power in the 18, late 18th century, and then sort of let you hear um, uh, federalists and anti-federalists talking to one another um, uh, in their own words, um, which I think is it's sometimes some of, the, some of the most fun stuff about getting to do this job is being immersed in, um, in these materials, which are often colorful and, and wonderful. Um, the very big picture background from which um, executive power debates about the US Constitution began um, was the broad sense of crisis that gripped the country um, in the 1980s, um, uh, <laughs> in the 1780s. <laughs> 1980s were wonderful. In the 1780s, um, around uh, uh, the ineffectiveness of national government. And uh, one of the remarkable things, um, to me at least, and a little bit contrary to some of my expectations when I first tackled this material going back or nine years, is how actually this sense was shared by what we now call the Federalists and what we now call the Anti-Federalists, um, in part because, of course, who the Anti-Federalists were was never anything even close to a cohesive political coalition, let alone a, a cohesive kind of monolithic um, uh, political philosophical position. Uh, but, but they sort of shared the view that things were really bad in the US. I mean, one of the, you know, George Washington um, uh, calls congressional requisitions, meaning the Continental Congress, uh, little better than a jest and a byword throughout the land, this idea of a joke or a, 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 a thing that mocks itself um, in the national government pervades comments from, um, uh, from federalists, uh, uh, another federalist author, uh, author says, how humiliating is our present situation? How necessary for the union is a coercive principle? No man prints, uh, pretends to the contrary. And, and, and that is getting at sort of one of the very significant um, policy concerns, political policy concerns that underlay the sense of crisis was what I think of as the execution problem. Um, Congress, and this is true both at the state level um, to a substantial degree, but especially at the national level, Congress can write all the laws it wanted to, but um, the degree to which th they were um, uh, 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 followed through on um, was extremely questionable, and often they really were sort of a sham of the legal process. The inability to execute the laws that were formulated by the um, uh, by, by the Continental Congress. What's interesting is that you get people, prominent anti-federalists like Sentinel, um, saying basically the same thing. The present confederation, um, he says, in a persuasive mode, attempting to convey that, yes, he understands the uh, political imperatives that are going on, gain credibility around at least extending some um, appreciation of what people writing, who've written the Constitution were trying to do. The present confederation, he says, is inadequate to the objects of the Union but then he and many other anti-federalists like him urged that the overreaction to, um, uh, to what was objectively a huge problem with American governance was a, a real threat to liberty. So it's sort of a, a concession of the common problem that yes, our, our, our government needs to have a much better system of executing that which it enacts, um, but the anti-federalist federalist dispute often, sometimes yeah, I mean, you get some anti-federalist denying that there's a problem at all, but um, often it takes the forms of um, federalists going on about how terrible the present situation is because there is no coercive principle in the national government. And anti-federal is saying, yeah, we know it's not so great right now, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna plunge headlong into the dreadful abyss of despotic government with swarms of enforcement agents. And they sketch this picture of, a, of a, you know, going way overboard in, in response to what's a real problem. And that's kind of the, the terms of the debate. It was an agreement that this coercive principle, that this need for execution um, was a thing that had to happen. Um, and so that's the background. So how do they fix the execution problem? 
to the extent that they did. And I think it's fair to say they did. And they fix it too, well. I don't know. But what did they do? The way that they thought about government power, and I'm speaking now of a, of a, of a grammar of conversation about political structures, that about contingent positions on what those political structures should look like, was to divide between two different ways to slice up what government does. One was subject matter competences. So like trade policy or policy with the Native American tribes or um, a policy around you know, what the nuisance laws should be. Subject matter areas of human existence that needed to be addressed and regulated by government. The competences, and, I, and I, that, that is an ahistorical, I mean, a, an ahistorical uh, phrase. I'm, I'm, I draw it from the e EU conversation because I think, I think it's useful for contemporary lawyers. But like subject matters, um, the competences of the government that spoke to things that had to be taken care of, foreign affairs, war. And that's one kind of slice of what government does. The other slice of what government does is to talk about the functions that are allocated throughout government to perform the different phases of bringing an idea into conception and then implementing it and specifically executing it in the world at large. And so the functional divisions of government were around the division between legislative power principally and executive power. Um, judicial power often gets called out all the more so once it's actually entrenched in the conversation they're debating. But it is, it is often viewed in, or in an orthodox sense as a subset of executive power. And I always love the Rousseau's um, uh, uh, summary of how this sequence of operations was thought to work because it's um, it has this totally naive uh, uh, body mind metaphor that is, goes against lots of what we know about modern neuroscience. But it's very it's, it's I think it's a, it's a lovely passage and it it sort of reflects how they talked about these things. He says every free action has two causes which pr concur to produce it. One moral, the will which produces the act. You've got the will, the other physical, the strength which executes it. Right? So for me to raise my hand, he goes on to say, I must mean for my hand to raise, and then my muscles must raise my hand. The, the, the will and the force are kind of conceptually, on this naive account of human um, action, uh, divided. He then goes on to say, the body politic has the same two motive powers, and we can make the same distinction between will and strength. The former, will, is legislative power, and the latter, strength, is executive power, the muscles that implement the order that has come from the brain, basically. And so what's interesting about um, this, uh, this tripartite scheme of government um, from a powers perspective rather than from a competences perspective is that they talk about it in terms of the creation of complete or perfect government. Your government was imperfect if it didn't have all the things necessary to go from intention to making reality happen on the ground. And of course, this is one of the things that again, both uh, Democrats and Republicans, both anti-federalists <laughs> and federalists um, kind of concede about the Continental Congress um, that it, it's not a perfect government. It is an imperfect government um, because it doesn't contain in particular not the shortness of legis legislative competences, right? Not that there's not a commerce clause, for example. I mean, they, they didn't like that, the federalists did in any way. But, but to call the federal government incomplete, which they did, had to do with the failure of execution, basically. And it, what's, what's, what's really quite interesting to me about this is, again, this is actually something that they agree about um, uh, descriptively now in terms of the grammar of the conversation across uh, anti-federalist, federalist lines. So Brutus says, um, to give the general government complete legislative, executive, and judicial powers to every purpose, would yield something frightening. One complete government, possessed of perfect legislative, judicial, and executive powers. And one of the things I think is most interesting about this is they talk all the time about sub-jurisdictions, um, cities uh, in particular, municipalities, as being either perfect or not perfect based on what their execution structure was looked like, uh, looked like, as opposed to the extent to which they had something like the police power over every conceivable thing that they might want to regulate. Okay, so we have this grammar. Um, we have the executive power, the legislative power, and basically the judicial power, subset of executive power maybe, as a suite of uh, tools or of, of abilities um, for the government to implement its substantive charges. And 
we have the need for a better executive principle of government, a coercive principle of government at the national level. And so what they do is they do expand legislative competencies for sure. The range of subject matter areas in the real world uh, which may be affected as a legal matter by the promulgations in particular, oh, not only, of the Congress. Um, but they also added expressly an enforcement power to operate directly on people, and that was um, the addition of the executive power. Now to go on 12 minutes, right? I'm trying to, okay. So how does this all cash out in terms of anti-federalists versus federalists um, during the debates? There's a really interesting sequence of uh, it's a very typical uh, uh, way for the argument to proceed in the different states, um, uh, and in the pamphleting in the different states, and in the actual ratification conventions in the different states. The problem that the Federalists started with was they had, in a very real sense, recreated, in some respects, a, a creature that was more powerful than, than the crown. Um, and that was a really big problem, because if everybody, could, if everybody could agree on one thing, it was that whatever we're doing, it can't be a king. It's not clear they knew what they meant by what it meant to be a king. It was sort of a, um, well, maybe more on that later. But, you know, I, I like Hamilton um, on uh, this. Um, Hamilton says, the writers against the Constitution seem to have taken pains to signalize their talents of misrepresentation, calculating upon the aversion of the people to monarchy. They have uh, endeavored to enlist all this uh, to attack the office of the president not merely as the embryo, but as the full-grown progeny of that detested parent, that is to say monarchy. We can't have a king. We better execution. We need a more forceful central principle of governing, but it can't be a king. Um, and, you know, Hamilton goes on. I just love this passage, so I'm going to take it a little more. He has been shown to us with the diadem sparkling on his brow and the imperial purple flowing in his train. He has been seated on a throne, surrounded with minions and mistresses, um, a despotism and voluptuousness, murdering janissaries. I mean, he, he's, he's over the top. Um, uh, but he's responding to people like Patrick Henry going on and on about this great and mighty president with very extensive powers, the powers of a king. Luther Martin... Um, saying the president will be a king in name as well as in substance once he decides to. All we're talking about is whether or not this office is, is going to be called the king or not because it's basically a king. And the, 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 the vulnerability for um, the Federalists on this front was that there were some really important powers the president was given that were regal in some important respects in like the, the 17th century, like most full-blown vision of Stuart government sense. Sorry, one second. In particular, the ability to veto, qualified fine, but the qualified negative existed in theory in England, but didn't at all really exist in England by the time that the, um, that the, that the founding is happening. The, the ability to make appointments, um, uh, that was a hugely um, contested proposition in the colonies, um, partly because it had such high stakes for how the places these people were in were run by the, by the, by the, by the agents of, of the English government. Um, and, uh, you know, some really important national security authorities, the treaty power, commander-in-chief power. I mean, these things are not small, and you can build on them to say, this is a king, um, and whatever else we want, we don't want a king. So what happens when the anti-federalists levy these kinds of charges that I've read, I'm going to give you one more response from the, from the federalists, they just get so annoyed at these exaggerating anti-federalists. Um, these, are, these are the warnings, the, the warnings about presidents are the same design that nurses tell children many stories about raw head and bloody bones. And I tried to figure out what raw head and bloody bones are and I couldn't figure it out. But, right, so this is, they're, they're mocking them. And, and then the conversation will pivot to, like, now let's get real. There's this moment where, like, like the tone of the Federalist pivot is to say, all right, back from this, you know, insane vision of, you know, the president with the diadem and whatnot, let's actually walk through the powers that um, the president has. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a contrast to how crown power works in um, the United Kingdom. One of the examples that I like specifically contrasts the glorious revolution uh, in England to what the Constitution was meant to have done, excuse me, in the following way. It addresses, the glorious revolution addresses, some important uh, individual rights protections for the, the people of, of England. 
But it leaves the legal substance of the crown prerogative, the crown powers, in place. And here's the criticism from a federalist saying how great the US Constitution is and how much we shouldn't be afraid of these like bloody raw bones or whatever. He says, had the English at this time limited the regal power in definite terms, instead of satisfying them with a, themselves with the Bill of Rights, there would have been an end of prerogative. But they, from habit, were contented with a Bill of Rights leaving the prerogative, that is to say the full suite of crown power, still inaccurately defined, to claim by amplification the exercise of all powers that weren't specifically restricted from it, right? So you've left open for arguments from amplification, you foolish English people who didn't you know, follow through on the spirit of liberty the way that we, the true heirs of right, the, the Gothic liberties um, uh, uh, are, are meant to have. And then the Federalists would turn to walk through the powers of the federal government, pardon me, of, of Article Two, and, and, and list them. There just aren't that many. I mean, this is one of the like, known things, textually speaking, not yet talking about the scope of the text. There just aren't that many affirmative powers given to the president. They're super important, some of them, but there aren't that many. And would say, like, compare this list to this long list of ki king powers under the royal prerogative. Um, what snake in the grass is there here? The Constitution plainly, openly, and without disguise tells us the titles, officers, powers, and privileges of the various officials in government and the purposes of their appointment. What snake in the grass is there here? And they do this thing where they list the Blackstone prerogatives um, and then pivot to the presidential prerogatives and say, the thing speaks for itself. Um, and that happens in lots of different conversations over the course of, um, of uh, uh, ratification. I've gone over, I apologize. Um, but that's sort of the upshot. Is the the, 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 the anti-federalists are taking a well-known aversion to the concept of monarchy, almost an emotional, like political imaginary, the emotional culture of like, we can't have a, pres a, a king, and are really twisting that with some real grounding and stuff like, especially the veto and the appointments power to say, you just made a king. And the, and the federalists are saying, come off it. There's like three things the president can do. Um, and, but also it's really important because he, he fixes our execution problem. And so they, they, they couldn't deny that the president was a really important, powerful office. But the move was to try to like deflate the, um, uh, the, the broadest accusations of the anti-federalists by getting very legalistic and walking through the actual legalistic terms of Article Two and sort of saying, what, what's, what's, what's the problem here? This is way less than the Crown has. So that's my quick summary of at least how I read the debates between the anti-federalists and the federalists. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. How about a hometown hero next? <laughs> professor Sai Prakash is the James Monroe Distinguished Professor of Law and Paul Mahoney Research Professor of Law here at the University of Virginia, where he focuses on separation of powers, particularly the executive branch. Along with numerous law review articles, his books include The Living Presidency, an originalist argument against its ever-expanding powers, and Imperial from the Beginning, the Constitution of the Original Executive. He also served as a law clerk to Judge Silberman and to Justice Thomas. Professor. Well, thank, thank you, Judge. Uh, the hometown homeboy wants to <laughs> express his gratitude to the superb UVA students who have put on this wonderful conference. Um, yes. You know who you are, and maybe you're not in the room, but maybe you'll hear about this. Um, it's, it's just nice to be in a room where everything kind of seems normal, um, and so I, I, this is just a wonderful, uh, wonderful two days. So um, the Article II vesting clause is like the decoder ring of Article II. If you read it correctly, you can make sense of Article II, the president's relationship to the other two branches, and much of our nation's practices. If you read it wrong, you have a cramped, ahistorical, a traditional reading, and the, the early presidency as well as the modern presidency seems like a Frankenstein monster. Um, now, of course, the Article II vesting clause has long vexed politicians, judges, and ordinary people. Some people believe that uh, the vesting clause does not vest any powers at all. It just is a reference to the other powers that are found in Article II, Section sections two and three, but many others, and I think including uh, majority opinions of the Supreme Court, read it as an actual grant of power beyond those specifically vested in the rest of Article II. Now, when I went to law school in the 1990s, uh, the president's power over law execution was denied by many. There was an article called the President's Uncertain Power to Execute the Law. Uh, 
Professors Larry Lessig and Cass Sunstein wrote a piece called The President and the Administration, which was designed to show that the President had no authority over so-called administrative laws and over so-called administrative departments. You won't find the word administrative in the Constitution. Nonetheless, they thought departments like Treasury and Post Office were administrative rather than executive. Um, they said the vesting clause was about title and number. They said it was about having one president, right? They've essentially read it as saying there shall be a president, right, with no, with no reference to power. So in that context, uh, a fellow you may have heard of, Steve Calabresi and I, wrote a piece in the Yale Law Journal called The Executive Power Over Law Execution. And we argued that the executive power principally is the power to execute the law. And we further argued that the president gets to direct and remove uh, officers who are executing the law because they are executing his power. Um, as Hamilton says, the president is the constitutional executive, as executor of the law, right? He has a constitutional warrant to execute the law. And uh, that's how Washington treated the executive branch. He directed officers, he removed officers, and he did all this without any statutory warrant. Um, most statutes said nothing about direction or removal. He did it anyway. To my knowledge, no one said that what he was doing was improper. Um, I think uh, since uh, Steve and I wrote that piece, um, this position that the president uh, has authority over law execution has become more of a mainstream position. Uh, you can judge whether it's because of our article or something else. I'm happy to say that Kurt Bradley and Martin Fl Flaherty endorse it, and, I, and I, I think Julian endorses some version of it as, as well. And so much of what he said today, I, I wholly endorse. Um, Later, a friend, another friend of mine, Mike Ramsey, and I wrote a piece called The Executive Power Over Foreign Affairs. We claimed that in the 18th century, the executive power had a foreign affairs component. And we further claim that the president has foreign affairs powers by virtue of the Article II vesting clause with important exceptions and qualifications. Here are two exceptions. Congress has the power to declare war. Congress has the power to regulate foreign commerce. The president doesn't have any of those powers. The only powers he has over those two things are to propose and to veto. Um, he can't do them on his own. And then there are certain qualifications, like the president's power to appoint ambassadors, qualified by the Senate's advice and consent function, and the president's power to make treaties, again, qualified by the Senate's advice and consent functions. Um, with respect to what remains of the executive power over foreign affairs, serving as an organ of communication with foreign nations, directing and removing ambassadors, establishing interstitial foreign policy related to the myriad issues that the nation faces. The president decides such matters because, after all, he has the executive power. I believe that Julian disagrees uh, with this last claim. I, I think uh, he thinks it's obvious that we are wrong. How do I know this? Well, he says that our claim is demonstrably wrong. <laughs> he also says it's implausible in his headings over and over again. Well, where I come from, them's fighting words. <laughs> Um, at the outset, let me say I'm more than puzzled by Julian's precise claim. Sometimes he says the vesting clause is an empty vessel, which sounds like it, it doesn't vest anything. Other times he says it's law execution. Other times he says it's also appointments. And then at the end of his article in the Pennsylvania Law Review, he says it's also a set of disaggregated powers. Um, I should add publicly that uh, I should add that Professor Mortensen has also said it might remove, it might include the removal power as well, and if it includes all these things, it doesn't seem like an empty vessel to me, right? Uh, it seems like it's quite full, in fact. Um, I think it's crystal clear that the executive power is not just about law execution. We know this because there are five state constitutions prior to the founding that grant their executives particular powers and then go on to grant other executive powers. Right? It, so it can't just be one thing unless all these constitutions um, are guilty of some sort of incoherence. Further, when people write about the, constitutional, uh, the Continental Congress at the time and subsequently, including historians like Jack Rakoff, they regard the Continental Congress not as legislative but principally executive. Why? Because it had the executive power over foreign affairs. It's precisely because it has this foreign affairs component that is regarded as an executive rather than a legislative. And when the Constitution was before we the people, many people adverted to the Senate's executive role in treaties because treaty making was considered an executive power in foreign affairs. And they discussed the president's role as stewarding our foreign affairs, even though, of course, there is no provision of the Constitution that specifically authorizes the president to direct 
interstitially or otherwise, foreign affairs, other than, of course, the vesting clause. Um, but the real acid test of our theory is the Constitution's early operation. President Washington made a number of decisions that are inexplicable, in my view, under Professor Mortensen's narrow reading of the vesting clause. Uh, under the Constitution, as you well know, the President has but few foreign affairs, specific foreign affairs authorities. He has the power to, or duty to receive ambassadors, the power to appoint ambassadors with the advice and consent of the Senate, and the power to make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. That is it. It doesn't, it's not a long laundry list. Um, but in fact, Washington did so much more, and uh, I'll say what he did in a moment. He served as the organ of communication with foreign countries. Under the Continental Congress, Congress was the executive and it received letters from foreign sovereigns. Foreign sovereigns continued to write letters to Congress and Congress did a remarkable thing. They would not open those letters under the Constitution. They would hand them over to Washington. Why? Because they no longer were vested with the executive power over foreign affairs, at least in this respect. And whenever they had a message for a foreign nation, they never spoke on behalf of the United States and they never delivered it directly. They gave it to President Washington and asked him to convey the, the sentiments of a particular chamber. The House would ask the President to convey their sentiments, not on behalf of the United States, but on the part of the House. And members expressly said it's because the President has an executive power over communications. He is uh, the organ of communications. Washington also instructed American diplomats. He also fired American diplomats. He fired James Monroe, right, the future fourth President of the United States, the fifth President, sorry. Um, and he decided, among other things, the territorial limits of the United States, what would happen if foreign powers waged war in the United States, and um, <clears throat> uh, the stance of America towards the warring parties in Europe. None of these actions are traceable to any specific clause in Article II other than the vesting clause. And in fact, that's the clause that people at the time cited. Washington said that he controlled Diplomacy, the, the, the content of foreign communications because he had to quote the supreme executive authority. John Jay, the uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs under the Articles of Confederation said the same thing. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said. There was a debate in the Senate, do we get to decide the destination and grade of US diplomats? And here's what Jefferson said. The transaction of business with foreign, foreign nations is executive altogether. It belongs then to the head of that department, except as to such portions of it as are specifically submitted to the Senate. It's a direct endorsement of the view that the vesting clause vests executive powers. Washington's diary says the exact same thing. As Washington put it, James Madison along with John Jay said that the Senate have no constitutional right to interfere with either destination or grade, their powers extending no farther than to an appro uh, approbation or disapprobation of the person nominated by the President, all the rest being executive and vested in the President by the Constitution. And of course, you know, as readers of Pacificus, Hamilton agreed with all, all this, it would not consist with the sound, rules of sound construction to consider the enumeration of particular authorities in Article II, Sections 2 and 3, as derogating from the more comprehensive grant contained in the General Clause, further than as it may be coupled with express restrictions and qualifications. And he goes on, the enumeration ought rather therefore to be considered as intended by way of greater caution to specify and regulate the principal articles implied in the definition of executive power. The general doctrine then of our Constitution is that the executive power of the nation is vested in the President subject only to the exceptions and qualifications contained therein. And then the great Chief Justice, John Marshall, agreed as a congressman. He said the president possesses the whole executive power, the, the, the sole organ of the entire nation and its external relations and its sole representative with foreign nations. That's how he described the presidency. So uh, there are more people that said similar things both before and after the Constitution's creation. Um, have I proven that they're right? I don't think so. I mean, I think you'd want to read more, and I encourage you to read uh, Professor Mortensen's article, and I hope you read mine as well. But I think I have proven that it's not uh, that we're not demonstrably wrong, or that we're that we're that we've made some implausible argument. I think you can say that we're wrong. Uh, uh, it's happened before, uh, where I've been wrong. But I I think it it beggars belief to think that Washington, Jefferson, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, 
and the great chief, uh, the great chief justice, were all demonstrably wrong and made implausible arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Our final guest is certainly no stranger to these debates, Professor Michael Rappaport. He's the Hugh and Hazel Darling Foundation Professor of Law and Director for the Center of the Study of Constitutional Originalism at the University of San Diego School of Law, where he focuses on administrative law, separate issue of powers, and federalism. Along with numerous articles, he is the author, with John McGinnis, of Originalism and the Good Constitution, a frequent lecturer at universities around the world Professor Rappaport also served in the Office of Legal Counsel, practiced appellate law in Washington, and near and dear to my heart, served as a law clerk on the Third Circuit. <laughs> Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the Federal Society for inviting me and the University of Virginia Federal Society for putting on really what's just been a great, great conference. So thank you so much. Um, today I'd like to talk about the non-delegation doctrine and, and its relation to the thought of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Um, so I'm going to get a little bit more specific here. Um, and in, in my view, the original meaning of the Constitution is best understood as incorporating a version of the non-delegation doctrine. And under that version, the Constitution imposes a strict non-delegation non rule in certain areas and a lenient rule in other areas. So under the strict tier, the amount of policy-making discretion allowed to the executive is either very limited or perhaps even completely eliminated. But under the lenient tier, the amount of policy-making discretion is largely unlimited. Okay, so let me start by describing uh, how I derived the non-delegation doctrine from the constitutional text. Um, and in my reading, the non-delegation doctrine flows from the vesting of legislative power to Congress and the executive power in the president, right? So a familiar sort of starting point. Uh, now, the meaning of these terms, I think, is ambiguous or unclear at the time of the Constitution. Um, sometimes they're understood as limiting legislatures from delegating policy making to the executive. And under this view, then, legislative power involved the exercise of policy-making discretion in enacting the law, but the executive power did not include such policy-making. Right? So you couldn't give to the president or the executive policy-making. But at other times, the terms seem to be understood to permit the legislature to delegate policy-making to the executive, so seemingly the, the opposite. And under this view, the executive power included the power to receive a delegation. That is, to be given policy-making discretion by a statute. So if these terms are ambiguous, how do, we, how do we resolve the ambiguity? And one way might be to simply decide on one meaning or the other for all areas. Right? So you either pick a strict non-delegation or a lenient non-delegation test, and you apply that across the board. But I think that's problematic and not the best way to go here. Um, there was a an historical pattern where delegation happened in some areas, but not in others. And people at the time sometimes seemed to recognize that delegation was more acceptable in some areas than in others. And so I think the better approach is to understand legislative and executive power to have differing content in differing areas. How do we do this? The terms legislative and executive power should be understood as terms having a legal meaning. And legal meanings often vary depending on the context. And the content of these meanings then would differ here depending on the area where they apply. So to determine these legal meanings in different areas, the starting point is to consider the historical pattern of, de of delegation. If legislatures regularly delegated in certain areas, then it's presumptively the case that such delegations were part of the meanings of legislative and executive power. But if legislatures typically did not delegate in an area, one would presume the legislative and executive power prohibited it. But it's not just history here, I think, that determines whether the delegation is permitted. In determining the meaning of these ambiguous terms, one would also consider constitutional structure and purpose. Um, so to take just one example, constitutional structure supports allowing delegations in areas where the states do not have primary legislative authority, such as 
legislation involving the territories, foreign and military affairs, and perhaps even foreign commerce. Whereas delegation may often conflict with federalism by allowing the federal government to more easily displace state laws, this is not a concern where the states do not possess legislative authority in an area, right? You're not, dis you're not displacing the states because they don't have authority in that area. Well, based on um, a review of this history, structure, and purpose, I tentatively conclude that the lenient tier of the non-delegation doctrine applies to areas such as spending programs, the territories, the internal organization of the government, and foreign and military affairs, and some others as well. By contrast, the strict tier applies mainly to the regulation of private rights in the domestic sphere. Not only were delegations involving the regulation of private rights historically rare, but there was also a strong purpose argument for assigning this area to the strict tier. Private rights, such as the common law right of property, were considered to be among the most important rights at the framing. Thus, it would have made sense for them to ensure that regulations of these rights should have the full protections of bicameralism, resentment, and the separation of powers. Now, this two-tier theory, two theory has various advantages, I think, and, and one that's worth emphasizing is that most of the alleged counterexamples offered by critics of the non-delegation doctrine are outside of the strict tier. And therefore, they don't really challenge this account of the original meaning, whereas they may challenge other accounts. Um, now, once we've identified the areas where the strict tier applies, the next question involves how do we distinguish between the permissible assignment of executive power and the impermissible delegation of legislative power? Right? And there's two basic ways of doing this. The most common one offered by people who seek to enforce a strict non-delegation doctrine is to draw a distinction based on an 1825 Chief Justice Marshall opinion between important subjects that the legislature must address and other matters of less interest as to which the executive can't fill up the details. So under this view, this, this filling up the details would, if delegated to the executive, constitute executive power. It's, it's limited, it's, it's, so it's not legislative. This means of distinguishing between permissible and impermissible delegation, it's a plausible take on the constitutional language, and it has the advantage of appearing to allow some examples of delegation from the founding, so some things you can understand in those terms. But it does have the disadvantage of leaving the constitutional distinction somewhat vague. While people like Justice Scalia hated such <clears throat> vague constitutional standards, he really hated them. Um, they should be enforced if that's what the Constitution means, if, if we're sure that's what the Constitution means. Um, but I want to point out that there's another way possibly to draw the distinction between legislative and executive power. And it's to define legislative power as the exercise of policymaking discretion as to the content of the laws. This is, after all, what legislatures do when they pass laws. What then can the executive do? The executive can interpret statutes and can make findings of fact. And in neither case is it engaged in policy making. It's just interpreting the law and finding facts. Thus, so long as the executive is restricted to making factual findings and engaging in legal interpretation, it does not exercise policy making discretion and therefore has not been delegated legislative power. This test of impermissible delegation has a significant advantage, I think. Unlike the filling in the details test, this test is pretty determinant. There's a principled answer to what is policy making discretion. There's also some historical support for this view. It's not merely a plausible understanding of the legislative power. It also seems to accord with James Madison's view of delegation stated in his Virginia report on the Alien Friends Act. In criticizing the act, Madison, in criticizing the act as an unconstitutional delegation, Madison wrote that details are essential to the nature of a law, especially one that regulates private rights. So under this test, a law that allowed the executive to fill in the details as to policy would be an unconstitutional delegation. By contrast, a law such as the one from the, the OSHA statute, which requires OSHA to adopt the occupational standard 
which most adequately assures to the extent feasible that no employee will suffer material impairment of health, that actually might be constitutional. So long as the statute is interpreted to deny the executive policymaking discretion, it would be constitutional. So for example, if the language to the extent feasible was interpreted to have a definite meaning, such as technological feasibility and business feasibility, and if OSHA was required to make factual findings as to that feasibility, then there would be no delegation of policymaking discretion. Okay, so towards the end here, I'm gonna come back to the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Um, <clears throat> So what can we say about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists here? Um, while the ratification debates do not really reveal much of a specific discussion of the non-delegation doctrine, I think we can discern some insights from their general attitudes. My sense is that the two-tier approach is consistent with the Federalists' overall view. They wanted both a workable government and one that protected people's liberties. And the two-tier view allows, seems to allow room for each of these values. By contrast, several of the principles of the anti-federalists pretty clearly favored a strict non-delegation doctrine. First, the anti-federalists supported a strict separation of powers, criticizing the Constitution for all kinds of things, such as mixing powers, such as having the Senate participate in executive appointments. Thus, they would have been likely to be especially concerned about delegating legislative powers to the executive. Second, the anti-federalists supported federalism, favoring, st favoring strong limits on federal power to protect against what they called a consolidation of the states. Requiring laws to go through bicameralism and presentment is an important method for limiting the, the federal government's power to regulate. Delegation circumvents these checks by allowing rules to be imposed by agencies alone. Finally, the anti-federalists supported a form of democracy with strong accountability to the voters. They often favored annual elections for the legislature and small districts so that people would know and monitor their representatives. And this also suggests they would oppose delegation because delegation moves the decisions on passing laws from representatives who stand for election to agency officials who do not. To conclude then, while I believe that both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists would support a non-delegation doctrine, I think the Anti-Federalists especially would have been champions of it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, we are going to run into some time constraints, and I am mindful uh, that my duty as moderator is to not to keep you too long from refreshments. But I know there are questions in the audience, and I know there are questions for the panel. Um, there's one that I'd like to ask, which I think uh, is only due uh, to allow the opportunity. Professor Mortensen, um, what does the vesting clause mean then, and, and how would you respond to uh, Professor Prakash's questions? Sure, yeah. Um, so to some extent, to some extent my answer reveals, um, how am I wrong? No. To some extent my answer reveals that I think the enterprise that I'm involved with is fundamentally different from the enterprise that originalists who conceive of their project as generating a set of legal rules to actually be applied by courts and by you know, lawyers in the executive branch and in the legislative branch, I am actually quite comfortable with uncertainty where uncertainty exists. Um, I'm actually quite comfortable with saying, look, a bunch of people said appointments are included. Not everybody, it didn't come up that often, but like, you can get there. I'm comfortable with saying, you know, the idea that the president would have the executive power but that people could be completely insulated from his or her control and do what they want. I mean, that's a little weird. Um, and yet, and here's the and yet uncertainty part, the actual practice of governance under these constitutions and under the relevantly analogous English practice shows that restrictions did exist, right? Like the, the, the king 
is said, the Crown, I should say, is said to have, quote, the executive power by Blackstone in a, in a I mean, not entirely an Article II like uh, listing of what the Crown's power is. Well, he says the king, but he means the Crown. And there were lots of people in England with important government roles who are insulated from uh, uh, removal, who possessed them, actually, as a property right sometimes. And does that make sense? I mean, at some level, it doesn't. But if you're approaching this as a historian who is trying to engage with immensely complex materials about a new um, thing, not entirely new, because there, there were state precedents for doing the tripartite whatnot. Tripartite whatnot. That's what they call it, the tripartite whatnot. Um, <laughs> Uh, but boy, this stuff was new. And so like, of course they didn't think of anything. Any one of you who's been involved in any way with drafting a contract, let alone writing a bill, think to yourself about whether you'd expect there to be gaps and imperfections and uncertainties. Come on, of course you would, right? So, so for me, both as a practicing lawyer and then also especially as a historian, my, the, the way I conceive of my job, and it sounds self-aggrandizing, but I mean it, is to, like, to ref reflect on what I see. And what I see for sure is that executive power is understood as like the hand squeezing because the muscles are going. What does that mean in practice? Well, they worked out some of it, but not all of it. I could imagine it meaning nothing more than almost a negative. Wherever else so the, the power to implement law is, it can't be subject to um, congressional participation. I could imagine it meaning the directive authority. Anytime the president wants to substitute his or her intentions for an executive agent, regardless of the government structure, they get to do that. I could imagine it doing lots of things. And so that's why the next phase of the project has to do um, as much uh, from a research perspective with a deep dive in the early, in the practice of the early republic um, as with you know, new original research beyond what I've already done. I think I wandered a little bit, but that's what I come back to. Oh, um, so in some respects, right, as between, does the executive power include, on the list of things from complete control down to removal, directive power, supervisory power, um, uh, you know, loose supervisory power, uh, uh, removal power, I can see arguments for all those different things. They didn't talk about it. But what it clearly doesn't do is contain any, and I want to revert back to the grammar, competences, no competences over subject matters. It has to do with powers, remember competences, uh, the sewers, uh, policing, uh, uh, treaties, uh, the areas of governance must be done. I'm running out of water, my mouth is drying up, sorry. Um, and then powers, the tripartite structure by which we can say of a city this very spot where we are now is a city. It has complete legislative, judicial, and executive powers. This city plainly did not have the treaty power. So what, what does he mean? What does Oliver Ellsworth, right, super significant federalist, mean by saying that? What he's saying is it can implement all the things that it wants to. He's not making a claim about foreign affairs powers. So um, at, at some level, um, I plead guilty, I guess, to not having a fully worked out theory about what I would write if I was an originalist judge, not committed to a theory and different to democracy. Um, I, I, I haven't done that work, but what I've tried to do is to reflect what the historical record actually says. And for the power to be an empty vessel means that there's a power in the sequence of functions of government rather than that it's a reference to um, uh, some subject matter area of governance. At least that's what I claim. Professor Maskin? Well, I was just going to, maybe maybe this is too long of a discussion to handle here, but I just wanted to say, I mean, if, if you're talking at least on the removal point about the king and examples of removal protection and it being a property right, would that not possibly be an explanation as to why the executive power actually could include supervisory and direction and removal power and here in the states presents itself early on without tenure protections but present itself in England differently because you would have the executive power limited by the property right whereas maybe that would not exist here in our system because of other distinctions and then the, the other question and this is probably more for the other panelists and, and you to, 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 to duke out but it does I mean Professor McConnell talks about this in his book as well I mean if the executive power really is only law execution it does appear that there are powers that are happening today like when foreign affairs and national security that then are missing from the Constitution if they don't also inherit in the executive power 
itself, it's 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 hard to have like a coherent view of where we get all the powers that are are they being exercised. And then the final thing I was going to just say is sort of a couple of practical like bringing it back to modern thought um, on the super supervision power with. Um, the executive power, I think actually the Supreme Court, of course, is moving more to a view that it includes the removal power within the vesting clause. But also, I think just in 2021, is also starting to perhaps understand the supervision power within the vesting clause to also include direction on the front end and the Arthrex opinion. So that's an interesting move. And then the final thing is, I think it is, we should really be working hard in all of these debates about whether the executive power itself inherently includes foreign affairs power, national security power. As a practical matter, coming fairly recently from the executive branch, I mean, I do think a lot of the work of modern practice is gonna be figuring out for Congress, if the courts aren't gonna step in, what the appropriate amount of power is to delegate. Because the debate in the, I mean, with all the vast executive power being exercised, it's really all happening now in the part that we all up here agree the president has, which is carrying out law. Like the Trump administration, I mean, maybe they talk some about treaty administration, military strikes, but even there, like they were figuring out what their statutory authority was. Like the authorization of use of military force was relied on for, for um, preliminary strikes in 2021. And emergency power, like the pandemic, the Biden administration, all the recent administrations, they're not sitting around like a Youngstown debate. What is our inherent executive power in the Constitution? Congress has given vast, 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 vast powers at the border and everywhere else, possibly, or at least vague statutory terms that um, are being, so whatever your view of the executive power, it actually would not, um, in, in, in a daily uh, basis, change anything if you still continue to have the amount of delegation in a statutory sense going to uh, the executive as we have um, today because so much is being shoveled, uh, shoveled in there. So that, I guess, makes Professor Rappaport's research all the more relevant and important. Why don't we turn to your questions with some of the time that we have remaining. Uh, some microphones coming around. And why don't we start with uh, the fifth panelist uh, who is participating today. Uh, I have a question primarily for Sai. Um, is your view of executive power that, such as over foreign affairs, that it is that it trumps any uh, congressional power, or is it defeasible? That is, president it, it, president acts first, but but, but if Congress uh, does something within its power that contradicts it, Congress wins. And, and maybe the concrete way to put this is you described the, the Jefferson position having to do with whether the Senate could direct where uh, foreign affairs ministers would go. Suppose Congress as a whole, rather than the Senate, said, well, we're going to send somebody of ambassadorial rank to, uh, to The Hague, pursuant to the Congress's power to establish offices, would who wins, the president or Congress? That's a, that's a, great, that's a great question, Michael. I think the, the first thing that's telling is that the president is creating offices, ambassadors and, and ministers, plenipotentiary on his own. This is the one set of offices that the president's creating on his own. All the other offices in, in the executive branch are created by statute. That itself to me is telling about the scope of the executive power because it's not happening anywhere else. Um, I, I, I'd further say, I think it was entirely plausible to, to suppose that they were wrong to believe that the president could create these offices, right? So my claim isn't that the President Washington did nothing wrong, but each of these examples is meant to show that they clearly thought he had foreign affairs powers beyond the ones specified in Article, uh, Article 2, Sections 2 and 3. And then as to your particular question, as you know, uh, Madison and Hamilton disagreed about whether there could be overlap in foreign affairs powers. Madison denied it as Helvidius. He said it would be, it'd be a terrible system if both branches had power over something. Whereas Hamilton was more open to the idea that there could be overlap. And the piece I wrote with Ramsey took the position that there was no overlap. But I think upon reflection, I think it's quite possible that there is overlap. And when there is overlap, I do believe that Congress wins. Not because it's obvious from the Constitution. It does say that laws are you know, the supreme law of the land, but the Supremacy Clause is principally about federalism and not about the separation of powers. Nonetheless, I think if, if President Washington believes he has authority and that Congress also has authority, I think he would conclude as a matter of constitutional structure 
that Congress's statute wins. The, the areas where there is overlap is unclear, but in, with respect to the proclamation that Washington issued, Hamilton expressly said that both the Congress and the President could declare neutrality, and that if Congress declared war, we would be at war. In the back. I think my question might have been answered to some extent here uh, with Professor McConnell's question, but um, uh, to Professor uh, Prakash. Um, so to give a concrete example of when Congress and the President butt heads on issues of foreign affair powers, uh, uh, Zita Kofsky v. Kerry, um, Congress says they can recognize a sovereign power. President disagrees, says that's well within my scope. How are, are we as originalists, how ought we decide those kinds of conflicts? I mean, you've clearly read the opinion. Um, Mike Ramsey and I took the position that the president has a power of recognition. Um, I subsequently came to the conclusion that there are at least some places where Congress has to have the power of recognition. So if you go back to the Revolutionary War, once France recognized the United States, Great Britain took that as a declaration of war against Great Britain. Because in the 18th century, if you recognize rebels, and aided them, you were also essentially declaring war against the mother country. So I think, um, I don't think that the president, you know, can decide to, uh, you know, aid rebels or recognize rebels or recognize the, uh, a rebel, you know, a rebel government um, or, in, you know, in a civil war context without running afoul of Congress's power to declare war. And there are other examples of this. John, Adam, John Quincy Adams gives an example of this as well uh, later on in the, in the 19th century that even though the president has the power of recognition, he, there's certain recognition as he cannot take because it would, it would, it would, it would violate uh, Congress's power to declare war. So I, I think the majority opinion is right, but of course uh, the majority opinion doesn't endorse the vesting clause thesis. They use uh, other clauses to reach that result. And then they further claim that Congress doesn't have any authority. I, I'm not sure it's obvious from the text that Congress doesn't have any authority. I, I think there are many textual hooks. But I, I do believe the practice mostly conforms to uh, what the majority uh, described. Down here in the front. I had a question for Professor Rappaport. Um, so talking about your OSHA example, saying the extent feasible, it's okay as long, it's not, not wouldn't be non-delegation, run afoul of the non-delegation doctrine as long as it's got a specific meaning. I was wondering under that theory, under your second theory, um, who would determine the specific meaning? And would it be kind of like a reverse of Chevron step one? Like if it's a vague statute, then it violates non-delegation. Well, and. So there's two questions here you have to think about. So the, the first is, are we giving to the executive policy making? The second question is, who gets, you know, is there judicial review? And if there is judicial review, to what extent is it is operating? I think those are actually two different questions. And um, uh, so, so if, if there is, if you're simply, if the, the executive is simply doing legal interpretation and factual findings, even if there's no judicial review, assuming that's okay, um, then that's not a delegation. Now, it, it may be problematic in the sense that, um, uh, that there's no supervision, um, there's no check, uh, or no normal sort of judicial review check, but they wouldn't be, the problem wouldn't be that there's a delegation of power there. Um, the separate question is, you know, do we have judicial review or not? And there could be and there could not be. And you could even imagine, I suppose, deferential kinds of judicial review. And maybe those are constitutional, maybe they're not. Uh, this is to uh, what you were talking about, Professor Mortensen. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, Obviously, we don't have a king, but the executive power has undeniably grown significantly since the Constitutional Convention. You know, how much were the anti-federalist fears well-founded? And from an originalist perspective, can their thoughts be used to uh, trim and tamper uh, down the current state of the executive power? 
Am I allowed to be Socratic and flip this back on you? <laughs> um, I, I think so. I mean, one of the, I don't have my, all my quotes in front of me, but one of the things I think is most striking, one of the things that really leapt out to me as the grammar of the founding started to come into, into view, as I read a whole bunch of stuff, was a comment from Madison about the scope of presidential power um, being kind of the, um, the uh, you know, the, the, not the dark horse, but the sort of, in any event, the thing that actually, notwithstanding everything the Federalists had said, could become a problem unless you checked Congress. And it takes a second maybe to, to see why that, he has a long discussion of this, why that's so significant. It, he's saying that what Congress does pursuant to its valid legislative competences is going to define the scope absent some specific textual you know, provisions in Article Two, what the president can do. And so this is one of the reasons connecting the separation of powers to federalism that he wants to lean in, especially as the 90s go on, to a vision that's more constrained. Yes, he's worried about Congress as such. Yes, he's worried about federalism. But he's also worried over the long run about a structure in which the more power we give Congress, the more power is going to be pushed off to the president. So from my own, my own personal perspective, is I'm, I have a lot of hesitations about a lot of the delegations that are on the statute books today. And I think that the fears of those who thought that we're looking at a massive centralization of power along administrative you know, uh, crown lines, or, I mean, look around us, right? I mean, it's, um, uh, yeah, um, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Mascott talked about uh, Trump relying on the AUMF. I mean, Obama did the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it is, the, the office has a way of leading its occupant to like squeeze every possible bit of power from everywhere it can. And boy, there's a lot of flex across a lot of different issue areas where that power exists, which is a long-winded way of saying, yes, for me, the solution is, is democratic politics. And either it works or it doesn't. And we, are, we, we either win with it or we lose with it. It's not judges sitting on the bench, all due respect. <laughs> I'm sure this would never happen in your shoes. And, and drawing like highly contestable conclusions from really abstract language to like impose a better vision of governance. So that to me is um, not the right role. It's not the right solution to what I think is a real problem. Can I just add one thing? I, to be clear, I was actually, I, and then just maybe this was clear in my remarks, I was actually not saying that's improper. I was, be right, because the, the executive branch, from the executive branch standpoint, they are to, so I agree with what you're saying, and saying, of course, within the executive branch, attorneys have to figure out what the power is that's been given to the president. So really, to the extent we're concerned about this, Congress has to, enact narrower or more precise laws that don't give so much power if it's concerned about the discretion or of the executive. The executive, of course, is trying to figure out what can be done lawfully to faithfully execute those broad laws that the executive's been given. And then we have to think about our theory of judicial review. How much, to what extent, is there a constitutional problem with this, as Professor Rappaport's raising? And at that point, obviously, well, the executive then, I would think, if he's faithfully executing, may not carry it out if it's an unconsciously broad delegation, or the courts would, would step in. So um, for this to work properly, I think, and for whatever we're concerned about to be peeled back, other institutions have to step up. It's not you know, all rising or falling on whether the executive's doing something wrong or right. Um, everybody has to uh, faithfully labor to interpret and carry out their proper constitutional role. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Professor Mortensen, I want to ask about the uh, hand and brain analogy a little bit. Uh, there was about one month between Washington taking office and Congress passing the first law. If there had been a significant emergency during that time, would Washington have had much power to deal with it, or would he have been essentially paralyzed by the lack of a signal from the brain? Uh, this is great, because it's like the thing that I'm most excited about in my research right now is tracing how emergencies were handled and talked about over the course of the 18th century in particular. There turns out to have been a surprisingly robust, and this too I'm not necessarily sure I'm such a big fan of, but a surprisingly robust tradition of executive actors in the broadest sense just doing what they needed to and then going to the legislative branch for, for retrospective sanction or for indemnity. Um, uh, you know, this is fascinating. I mean, I've 
I know there's not much time. Read about the 19, I'm doing it again. I, I exist so much in the 18th century, I always start with the night. Um, read about the corn crisis of, I think, 1766. There's a guy in a port, I forget which one's sitting here right now, in England, who notwithstanding a, a, a statute on the books that tells you here's how you handle when there's a corn shortage, which is to say a wheat shortage, um, uh, this is the only thing. He goes beyond that. And the set of questions that emerge from that is, as the parliament debates whether or not to indemnify him map onto the Youngstown question actually like remarkably well. And so my answer is violate and ratify, almost certainly, would, would have been what would have happened. Would um, arguments have emerged as they did uh, uh, in other respects for the legality of what he would have done, I, I, I bet you. I bet you. You, you turn to the commander in chief calls. Uh, maybe with you know sufficiently foresightful Hamilton, turn to turn to the executive power clause. But it, it, they were aware of the risks of um, creating officers that were limited to their powers in a very stark way. And one of the ways there was flex was be like, was a comfort level with violating the law that kind of creeps me out, but that they were more comfortable with. And they relied on the downstream political process to to fix it. Yeah. So. The only thing I want to say is um, I'm also struck by that by that tradition, and, uh, and I know Sai has has looked into it as well. The the interesting thing about it is just think about how different that understanding of how we deal with Absolutely. emergencies is with our world today. So the officer has got to put himself at risk, and uh, you know he's going to be liable unless you know after the fact the legislature comes in and gives him immunity. Not what we have today, which is like, oh yeah, we'll violate whatever, and and you know, it, it, as long as it's you know not not a you know so clearly the the, the case we're, we're immune. That's a very different understanding of of the structure of incentives. Yeah, I, I want to agree with what Julian and, and Mike said. If you look at the Revolutionary War, what you find is a series of statutes at the state and national level delegating temporary authority. Uh, often geographically constrained to uh, governors and, and the commander in chief. And then when those uh, grants expired, the emergency authority went away and would have to do with trying people uh, in military courts for various offenses like not taking continental currency, things that you might think should be tried in ordinary courts being tried in military courts. So I think Julian's absolutely right. There was no executive power of emergency. Um, in America, and and what they would do is, if it was push came to shove, they would act illegally, and then, and then ask ask to be forgiven, and and then they would be forgiven if it was truly an emergency, and and then Mike's further right that that really changes your incentives, right? Because you're worried that they might not indemnify you, uh, and then you're going to be in trouble. Uh, but that is the structure of how that's how states and and the Continental Congress did dealt with the emergencies that were prevalent during the uh, Revolutionary War. I want to thank all of the panelists for this most extraordinary <laughs> And our thanks as well again to the chapter here at the University of Virginia for this wonderful weekend. Thank you all.